Thank you very much and, and welcome. I'm going to, if you'll excuse me, walk around. I've always walked around when I've given lectures. It, it started actually here in this building many years ago, being a sociologist teaching medical students. And you, you had to move, is the old joke, because paper aeroplanes and so on will come towards you. Uh, so forgive me if I wander up and down. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about is the current sex industry, largely in this country, uh, and mainly about female sex workers. And I wanted to challenge a number of myths and try and provide a kind of framework within which we can think sensibly about whether this field of work requires regulation, and if it does, how might it best be regulated? Because it's an industry which you will appreciate excites strong emotions. And sometimes evidence-based policy is replaced by policy-based evidence. In other words, people come with a moral or political commitment uh, in relation to the industry and then look for evidence that supports their position. So really, I'm standing here trying to represent evidence bases uh, uh, as useful resources for policy rather than the opposite. What I'm going to do is to, to look very quickly at a number of popular stereotypes about sex workers, uh, make the distinction that, that I've just introduced rather more clearly between evidence-based policy and policy-based evidence. Uh, talk about the heterogeneity that you find in the population of sex workers, which is much more uh, uh, obvious, I think, than many people realize uh, and that stereotypes suggest. Uh, I'm going to use uh, a typology of sex workers that I generated in, in a paper a while ago as a way of giving sort of flesh to this notion of heterogeneity or variety. Look at different ways different countries regulate the sex industry and then identify two discourses that have been particularly influential in the way people have seen and responded to the industry. Uh, the one, public health discourse, which has tended actually to be quite liberal, and the other, much more current now and quite powerful, uh, and I think more ideological, uh, a sex trafficking discourse. And they play on the kinds of policies that, that are currently being considered in relation to the sex industry. Another, a number of countries have changed course recently. And we're looking, of course, at what's happened in those countries, although it's early to, to uh, deduce too many uh, consequences. I'm going to suggest that the law should be, sociologists shouldn't really do shoulds. They should be talking about how things are and why. But the law should be fairly pragmatic. We, we should look at the likely consequences of a law rather than let our moral precepts dictate what the law is regardless of the consequences of its uh, implementation. I'm then going to focus on one group with which I did a little research which I call opportunistic sex workers. Uh, these are essentially people who've come from abroad to work for brief periods of time in the sex industry in London. It might well be other European and other cities uh, throughout the world, but I'm going to take this, this as an example, which I think forces home some of the points that I would like to make, uh, and I'll end by saying a word or two about what sociologists often call agency, which is our capacity to make choices. Uh, and that's, in a way, at the kernel of, of the sex industry, because many people think uh, a woman, a man too, for that matter, cannot possibly choose to be involved in that industry. There must be some kind of coercion or constraint to the choices that they might think they are making. Uh, I want to challenge that too. I think that is simply wrong, uh, and the evidence uh, will confirm that. So the notions that, that many people still have, that there is something evil or immoral about people who work in the sex industry, uh, I think we can debunk that myth fairly clearly on. What you find uh, if you interview people in the industry is they're very much like people outside the industry uh, involved in other work. Uh, 
and there is a clear and understandable route for them into that particular kind of uh, labor. There's a notion, too, linked to, to the idea I just suggested, that a woman couldn't possibly choose to be a sex worker, that they must somehow be victims of their backgrounds or their circumstances. Uh, again, that is not true. Doesn't mean that our choices, but all our choices, are constrained by the circumstances in which we find ourselves, but to take agency away and to suggest that this group in particular is not able to make decisions is again wrong. The notion that they're vectors of disease is an interesting one. We've had a lot of uh, discussion recently, not surprisingly, perhaps around this time of year, around HIV. Uh, evidence today coming out suggesting that, what is it, one in four people who are HIV positive are unaware of that. And this is, this is uh, an infection which is spreading into the heterosexual community where once it was contained uh, in other uh, segments of, of our society. If you look at the evidence in this country around sex workers, you actually find very low rates of HIV positivity. Perhaps the best study we have is a longitudinal study, a study that takes place over time, based at the Prade Street Project and St Mary's Hospital. And Helen Ward and Sophie Day followed up sex workers. Uh, they encouraged to, to use their clinic over a period of time. And their figure was under 2% HIV positive. HIV positive. Now, if, if I ask my students what kind of proportion of sex workers do you think uh, have had HIV or AIDS, then they might say, they do say, 40%. 60%. It's much lower than that. And I think what researchers discovered early on is that this community, not surprisingly, rather like uh, the gay community, were extremely conscious, extremely early of the threat to them and took appropriate measures. So studies suggest, for example, that condom use is around 98% uh, using those the, the same study I, I cited before. It's a very high rate of insistent condom use for penetrative sex. In fact, the risk, if we want to look at HIV, is to the women, and for that matter, men who work in the sex industry themselves, not from clients, but from non-paying partners. Uh, and it's an interesting dynamic that researchers have revealed that you find both for men and women and in other countries. And that is, the work involves sexual intimacy for which condom use provides a kind of barrier. But if you have sex with a barrier of a condom with your clients in your day-to-day -day business, it becomes difficult then to use those same barriers in personal intimate relationships. So it's not uncommon for condom use to be much lower between sex workers and non-paying partners than it is with their clients, which can leave them at risk. There's a kind of paradox buried there that you wouldn't know about unless you were familiar with the research. The notion that they're uniquely exploited, I think it is, is also wrong. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of cheap labor uh, around, and we can say that a lot of people in a lot of work environments are subject to exploitation. The notion that there's something unique about the exploitation of sex workers, uh, I think, is very suspect. <clears throat> it's a very group, difficult group to study, uh, and I think we need to face up to that. We don't know how many sex workers there are in this country. I'll give you an estimate a, a little later. Uh, so the notion that we can construct ourselves a probability sample and then extrapolate from our work to the population of sex workers as a whole it is just not possible. So we rely on ad hoc studies, quantitative studies, qualitative studies, and the picture that they in combination give us of this uh, workforce and how it operates. What we also lack, and I think this is a very important point, is comparative data. So what you will often see are studies of sex workers that find, for example, <coughs> over half of them come from broken families. Now the assumption there is that this is causal. That if a family breaks up, this is one factor that predisposes uh, 
to entry to the sex industry. But if you had a comparative sample of <clears throat> secretaries, whatever it might be, you might find exactly the same proportion. You wouldn't be saying then that a broken family predisposes women to go and become secretaries. So unless you can compare populations, it's very difficult to draw uh, very sensible conclusions. But I think it's important that we distinguish between policy which is based on, not perfect, it's never perfect, but the best evidence that we have, and the construction of evidence to suit policy decisions that we've already taken. And you do get that tension, that dynamic, in discussions of the sex industry. <coughs> A little bit of background data. Our best guess, guesstimate, I suppose, is what it is, that there are around about 80,000 sex workers in the UK. And if we look at the London figures, uh, I've just given you a kind of snapshot here. There, there may be some surprises. 30-40% of sex workers in London are men. Uh, this is not true of other cities or provincial towns in, in the UK. London is unique in this respect. But it's, it's a much more invisible population uh, comprising male sex workers. Four out of five work indoors. So the stereotype we probably have is <clears throat> a young girl in high heels, short skirt, walking around King's Cross Station at one o'clock in the morning, maybe with needle marks on her arm and so on. It's a stereotype. Uh, four out of five workers work indoors and in a variety of settings that I'll mention. Nearly two-thirds born overseas. Median age of entry, 24. So the notion that, that people are coming in very young to the industry, sometimes, of course, they do, but it's not the norm. Uh, they tend to come in later than many people anticipate. Uh, there is drug use in that community. It, it's lower in indoor than in outdoor workers. And what we're actually seeing at the moment, the, the, the best data that we have, is a declining rate of sexually transmitted infections, um, <clears throat> including HIV. This is not something that the evidence suggests that is growing in that community. It's a heterogeneous population. There are a wide spectrum of sex workers. They're not all people coming from impoverished, disadvantaged backgrounds who have no other options and are driven as a last expedient to, to sell sexual services to, to strangers. That's an overly simple picture. There's a hierarchy, too, of, of practice. There are diverse settings in which sex workers apply their trades. So there are uh, sex workers who work for, for madams who are all but invisible to the community as a whole and earn vast sums of money. There are women who work for, for escorts where a, a typical fee would be 150, 200 pounds an hour and the escort would, uh, the, the agency would take a, a third of that would be a typical practice. So these are considerable sums of money uh, uh, towards the top end of the hierarchy. There are people who work independently from their own flats. There are people who work in, uh, in saunas, <coughs> massage parlours and so on. And there are people working on the streets. But a diversity of background uh, in many ways across that, that hierarchy. There's a mix of motivations. If, if you were to conclude that the primary motivation is money, then <clears throat> this is obviously so. But the need for money can take very many different forms. I'll give you some, some examples of that. Well, we can take one now. If you increase indebtedness in the student community, in the wake of that, you will find more students entering the sex industry. And some agencies have recognized that and have been found advertising on campuses. So now we have a few academic studies of students who are entering the sex industry in order to, to pay off their debts, uh, in order to survive and, and so on. Now, <clears throat> one might think, well, you're short of money, you're, you're, you're in trouble. That this would seem to be uh, a choice that, that is marginal, it's right on the edge. It's not a choice that many people would, 
would make. But imagine the, the scenario. You're, you're, you're a student. Uh, <clears throat> you're in debt. You owe money. You're being asked for money. Uh, you can't go to your parents. You don't want to go to your parents because you've got two younger siblings who themselves will want to go to university, and you know your parents have, have cash flow problems. They won't be able to come up with the money. So you're reluctant to go there. You don't feel you can. Now, you don't think, I'll enter the sex industry, but then you meet somebody who's also a student. And I take a real case, somebody I interviewed doing a master's degree. And you meet her in the bar, you chat, <clears throat> You're depressed, you, you can't see your way out of your financial hole. And after a few drinks, it, it, this, this other girl says, well, I mean, you know what I do. I mean, obviously I don't talk about it, but uh, I see uh, <clears throat> a fairly affluent middle-aged guy once a week, and that funding, that's funding my master's course. So this was a postgraduate student, not at UCL, but at the University of London, uh, that I interviewed. Now, she says that to the girl who's struggling. Still doesn't think, well, that's for me. But, but under pressure, I think, well, I'll... Because I'll, the other girl said, I can put you in touch with somebody. So I'll, I'll... Just for once, I'll do this. Because I, I can clear a couple of bills. And <clears throat> it happens, and she feels dirty, and she as many showers and, and cries. A little bit easier the second time. Doesn't think of herself as a prostitute or a sex worker, she's a student. This is just a way of making ends meet. So what I'm saying, in a roundabout way, is that perfectly ordinary people trying to work out their affairs day to day can find themselves in situations that they hadn't anticipated. And don't let's take their agency away. Uh, Whatever the consequences might be of their decision, they've made a decision, and maybe they've cleared their debt. When we look at the opportunists, we'll see it, it's not an unfamiliar mindset. I want to say, too, that, that there are mixed experiences in the industry. Uh, mostly, people do the business as quickly as possible, take the money, and it's over. Uh, it's not any kind of body commitment or intimate commitment, commitment on their part. But there are exceptions to that. Uh, it is pleasurable with some clients for some women. It's not always a horrible experience where they feel exploited. There are moments for many of them where it's enjoyable. So it, it may be a stereotype that says this is a horrible business and sometimes it is like that. Sometimes it's like that all the time for some practitioners. But not all practitioners. It's more varied. And clients, different estimates of numbers of people in the general population or proportions that, that uh, go to, to sex workers. Uh, a national study found that one in 10 men uh, admitted in a survey that they'd been to a sex worker in the previous five years. Uh, some people estimate, researchers in the field, but it's an estimate, that it may be much higher than that. And people have talked about 30 or 40 percent. But there's a tendency for them to be younger, to be unattached, but it's across the board again. The, the, the clients are a heterogeneous population as well. Here's my typology. Again, it stresses heterogeneity. <coughs> it's not complete. Uh, somebody suggested to me quite recently, that there are, uh, as it were, specialist sex workers who, who, who provide services only for people with disabilities. Now, they don't appear on that uh, typology. But let's run through it quickly. Th these are the names I've given them, not always sort of, I think, good names. Coerced. There are people who are coerced. And I'll come back to that. People who are abducted, who are taken off the streets uh, in our countries and transported to European or other Western nations, and indeed other parts of the world, and forced to work. At its worst point, a kind of sexual slavery. And sometimes their families back home are threatened. So they know if they try and leave, and they know the people, and they know they're in their home countries and their home villages, 
their families will immediately be threatened. So at one end of the spectrum, you had a kind of trafficking and slavery that, that we would all have no hesitation in condemning. There are people, I've called them destined. I remember interviewing one, uh, one girl, a single mum, who was uh, uh, selling her services in central London. And her sister was a sex worker. Her mother had been a sex worker. I, in a way, it was a, a, almost a tradition that she was following. Why was she following? Because she didn't have uh, educational qualifications that gave her uh, distinct options. And she could make more money this way, more autonomously, because she controlled the, the time she worked, didn't have to clock on at nine, clock off at five. She could suit the hours to looking after her child and make more money she could any other way. So it had become a kind of uh, way of handling uh, disadvantage. Survivors. I talked about debtors very briefly of our students. There are many other people, of course, uh, in significant debt these days. And there's some suggestion, it's not been documented properly yet, that we're already seeing increased recruitment into the sex industry by people who, who are looking for a way out of their predicaments. Uh, people who use drugs. Again, this, this, is, this is something that the, one would not be happy about. You've got an 18-year-old girl who is uh, an injector of heroin, who is selling her body for 30 quid a time so she can get the next fix. Agency is very restricted in these ways, and, and it's not a happy set of circumstances that we can be relaxed about. People like all workers, there are people who turn it into a job, and there are ways of, of if you're aging as a sex worker, specializing in particular services for particular clients that allow you to continue in that work. So there are some people who put together a kind of career out of sex work. It isn't something that necessarily occurs over a short period of time. There are opportunists. This is a group I'm going to come back to. And these are people who, who make a decision that they are going to collect money to achieve A, B, or C, and then stop. And I interviewed a, a dozen women uh, from Eastern Europe who I classified as, as opportunists in precisely this way. Uh, there was one, for example, lived with an alcoholic father who wasn't abusive, but, but, but it wasn't the circumstance of, of her choosing. She wanted out. She wanted to rent her own flat. So she came to London for, I think it was a, a three-month period, working for an agency, to, to save enough money to give her independence. And another girl, I remember, in the same category, she did something which may or may not be advised. She not only took clients through the agency, she gave clients her private number. Agencies aren't very keen on this. Uh, and so clients contacted her direct and saw for, for, for a reduced fee. And she was available pretty much around the clock. And she saved £30,000 in the three months that she uh, had decided to work in London. And that £30,000 was a lot more to her in Latvia than it would be to somebody living in London. So she'd set herself up. Uh, and I into, oh, amongst the 12 graduate teachers from Moscow, uh, a music teacher from St. Petersburg, someone who wanted to study. So there is decision-making there. But, but we'll come back to, to that group in, in a little bit. And what I call bohemians, there are people, uh, doctors, teachers, nurses, who sample the sex industry not out of any financial need. As a form of experimentation, um, who knows, you can construct your own explanations. But there are a residual group, if you like, of miscellaneous people who are not driven by any obvious uh, factor to, to enter the sex industry. If we look at regimes of control, I'll run through them very briefly because our, our time is limited. There are countries who try and wipe out prostitution or the sex industry. United States is one, um, China, Russia. It doesn't work 
They have very lively sex industries. So I'm going on the Trans-Siberian Express. I went from Moscow to Beijing. Uh, in Moscow, the hotel we stayed, because I, I mean, I can see sex workers now. <laughs> it's just, you get used to it. In the hotel, in the bar, were at least half a dozen sex workers. And it's illegal. You know, so it's still a lively industry. As soon as we got to Beijing, the guide said, when you get to your hotel, you'll get a phone call. And it'll be, would you like a girl to come up to your room? You know, so, so you know, in, in a country where it's illegal, it's not well controlled. And that would certainly be true of the US. So it may be that your, your morality says this is an abhorrent institution and we should legislate it out of existence. Your morality is yours to consider, but you're not going to legislate it out of existence. Most countries go in for some kind of regulation. They, they try and constrain or keep the industry within certain parameters. And we fit into that category. So it's not an offence to sell sexual services in this country. The, the, the legislation varies slightly, which is why I put England and Wales. Varies throughout the UK. But it is an offence to procure someone uh, for, for the industry. It is an offence to, to, to loiter with intent or solicit on the streets. Um, and we're seeing some changes. There's a tendency towards further criminalisation rather than decriminalisation at the moment. On behalf of certainly New Labour, uh, and we'll see what happens under the, the uh, Condemn Coalition. Legalisation. But, uh, Germany has Eros centres, where it's legal to work, but within certain prescribed spaces and under certain conditions. Dodgy because people work illegally outside of that. And if they're working illegally, there's a problem that they tend to be beyond the reach of, for example, health services. So there may be people working illegally who are HIV positive in Germany and, as it were, beyond the reach of, of agencies that might be at their disposal otherwise. They won't be in the Eros centres, but they may be outside. And there are countries, New Zealand is, is an example, which is uh, written up quite positively at the moment, where they have decriminalised. That, that they have said essentially that sex workers should be treated like other workers. They'll be subjected to the other laws, public nuisance laws, etc., etc., um, but we shouldn't make special laws for, for this group. And in some parts of Australia, the Netherlands and so on, that's the route that, that, that people have taken. We'll come briefly back to that. Um, to, to bring it up to date here, um, since 2010, another offence has been added. If a client has sex with someone it turns out has been in any way coerced or forced into the business, and that's not very well defined, then that client will be liable. That client has committed an offence in law. And not knowing, strict liability and so on, not knowing that he's done so, will be no defence. Now, there are people, including lawyers, who... A, question the advisability of the law, but B, certainly question how it can be applied. And there now is a considerable move to, to make being a client an offence. They've done it in Sweden, 1999. Norway followed suit. Denmark, interestingly, has just decided not to go in that route. I want to say that, that laws have unintended as well as intended consequences. It's kind of obvious from what I've said already. You may be opposed to women, but not just women, selling sexual services. You may be deeply opposed on religious, moral grounds, and so on. It's fine. But you cannot think that therefore you can legislate it out of existence. It doesn't work like that. And many people would argue that if you do try and legislate it out of existence, those you put at most jeopardy are the workers in the industry. Because they then disappear into a kind of criminalised subterranean world in which it's difficult for, for authorities and people who want to help them to reach them, whether it's delivering health care or 
or whatever it might be. And they fear contact with authority because if they're single parents, are they going to have their kids taken away? Because they can't, by definition, be satisfactory parents. So what I'm saying is that there, there are often, and it's bread and butter for sociologists, unintended consequences for what we decide to do, even if we decide to do it for, for, for the right reasons. Often the reasons are contested, of course, in a domain like this. Uh, we need to be wary of moral crusades. I think if, if moral crusades lead to law, it's often, or always, often bad, bad law. And that we should uh, move in the direction of being pragmatic. Okay, so these two discourses. I'm going to have to move quite rapidly. I might skip a bit. Uh, public health discourse was really... It, it brought about a kind of surveillance of this population uh, in the mid-1980s when it was thought that AIDS could be a major threat to the heterosexual population. Not wrongly. And thought maybe a means of transmission into the heterosexual population would be through sex work. Liberal, because on the whole, they found that that was not a major route of transmission here. It is in other countries, not here. So they backed off. They didn't call for more legislative control of the industry. They tended, in fact, the other way. If you take the health professionals and the researchers in the round, that their feeling was towards decriminalization rather than further criminalization. The sex trafficking discourse is rather different, and I think it tends more to be uh, ideological. Often it's a position advanced as if, wrongly, anybody who comes from abroad to work in a city like London must somehow have been coerced. And it's simply not true. But if that image of the sex worker can be sustained. It lends itself to further legislation against the industry. So there is an interest, if you like, in pursuing that agenda for people who want legislation against the industry because they believe, and their convictions may, may be entirely genuine. Maybe we could commend them because they think there's a lot that's unsatisfactory that happens to people who, who enter that industry uh, and they need to be rescued. We'll look at some figures in a minute. That, that, that questions that. This was a massive police operation in the, uh, a few years back, called Pentameter 2, where a number of police forces, uh, 55 up and down the country, raided 822 <coughs> premises with a mission to rescue women who'd been trafficked or otherwise coerced into the industry. They said they made 528 arrests. It was later found out that that wasn't actually right uh, because of misrecording and so on. It was 400 and something uh, that were actually arrested. But where did it end up? I've cut a long story short because this was researched subsequently. It ended up with five convictions of male traffickers two of whom um, had been prosecuted before the pentameter operation, and three of whom had been known about before the pentameter operation, or they were, they were prosecuted during it. And th this is a fairly constant picture. The notion that a lot of women are trafficked, and those who come from abroad must in some way have been trafficked, and therefore there, there is a, a population out there that needs rescuing, is not borne out by the facts. Does trafficking occur? Yes, it does. And of course, when, it's, when it does, it's horrendous. But we should, I think, have a wider concept of trafficking. We shouldn't just think of sex trafficking. We should talk of human, human trafficking. And people are trafficked into slave labor, not just sex slavery. Uh, that may well be a much bigger problem than just settling on the sex industry. Uh, Nick May uh, did an ESEC-funded study, and his judgment that was 6% of the women that he saw had, had not been abducted 
and trafficked. But there was an element of deception, um, or sometimes more, in their coming to work to London. That's the figure he put on it. Um, another way of putting it is sort of 94%. 94% had, 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 had actually, uh, most of those arrived in London not to enter the sex industry, but had entered the sex industry after a range of other jobs and so on in London and done it for financial purposes. If we look at the opportunists, um, what I want to say is that in many respects, these women, a lot of those I saw with degrees, had made a calculated choice to do this, to raise money over a limited period. Their agency cannot be sort of structured away from them, taken away from them. They were making choices. There were push and pull factors. The pull factors, they could earn a lot of money. Most money in Zurich, apparently, but a lot of money in London, too. Push factors, the feminization of poverty in Eastern Europe. That leaves women, it's happening here, too, and will have consequences. That leaves women, in particular, disadvantaged, especially single mums. So these are the push factors, the pull factors, the money they can make doing other things. And we have to question the public health view, which has been that this group may be at greater risk of health problems. And it looks like it's the other way around, that they are less risk. And maybe that's something to do with the recruitment of people who come over. And the ideological use of the notion that uh, they can't be exercising choice, that they've been trafficked and therefore the institution as a whole uh, needs to be legally pursued. So they don't have higher rates of STIs and HIV, which has been part of the... Uh... This is the whole stigma. It goes back 20 years. These are the things that are wrong with particularly women working in the sex industry. Um, does it still apply? Well, the culture shifted, is what I want to say. Giddens talks about the post-pill universe in which sex has become separated from procreation and has had a recreational outlet. It's changed the behaviour of younger people. Cultural relativity, we now have a variety of different ways of seeing things. Quick example, teaching in the 1970s. You had a student who believed in God and a student who was an atheist. They couldn't both be right. They would argue like hell. I can remember students shouting at each other. I don't now. Students will now say, well, it works for you, that's great. So, so, so we live with difference in different ways, and that means we live with different kinds of sexuality and sexual practice in different ways. The whole culture has become more erotic, and we see that in images used, and there's a beginning of the theory that people have erotic capital, and we should recognize that women, but not just women, and it's not just sexuality, it, it's charm and so on as well, use this capital as other people use money and links and networks. Uh, so it's part of, if you like, the attributes that some individuals possess, and we should recognize it. Okay, I'm ending. Um, Don't let's rule out the fact that people make their own decisions. Our decisions are always structured, but they're not structurally determined. And people who work in that industry, of course, reflect this as well. Sorry to go. I've probably only got time for one question, because I've only got a minute. One here. Um, I've heard the, um, an argument that says the, the reason there are so few convictions of um, tra traffickers is that the victims are afraid of giving evidence, for fear of what will happen to them, will they be sent back to their country, or what will happen to their family. Um, what, what do you make of that? Well, I think it's a factor. I mean, certainly it sometimes happens. 
But I mean, what you also have to recognize, I think, is that, that when they went searching for women to rescue, they couldn't find them. <laughs> what rescue amounted to, incidentally, was shoving them out of the country, not in some way helping them, but getting rid of them. So I think you're right to make the point, and, and, and sometimes this happens. But it seems to happen on a much, much smaller scale than those that use the trafficking discourse to, to, to attack the institution would have us believe. I feel I shall have to call it a day there. It's a, it's a pity, because it's a very interesting subject, and made even more so by today's lecture. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.